Hello and welcome to the Society for Critical Exchange interview series. My name is Apindra Mahan and with me today is Professor Floyd Merrill. Um, and he's uh, from uh, Purdue University and his many articles and, and books cover issues of Latin American culture and literature, social justice, philosophy, theory, and through it all is semiotics. Welcome to the series. Thank you very much. Um, Pleasure to be here. I want to start off with <laughs> what some people may have no idea of, and that's what semiotics means. Uh, well, there's this very succinct definition of semiotics, uh, the study of science. So I was going to ask you, what does it mean to you more than that? And uh, related to that, what, what drew you to, to semiotics as an endeavor? Yes, what is semiotics? That's a question that's bothered me for years. I, I'm not sure that I can really answer it <laughs> in a few uh, succinct sentences. But uh, semiotics, like you mentioned, in the most general sense is study of signs. Mm -hmm. Now, signs, of course, include signs which tend to fall into the category of linguistics, mm -hmm. language signs, artificial language signs, such as logic, mathematics, computer, computer uh, um, language, and such as that. It has to do with nonverbal expression, mm -hmm. communication, body language, as they usually put it. It includes animal signs. Mm -hmm because animals communicate most usually in very subtle and sophisticated ways, more sophisticated than we would like to admit in many cases. And signs in general, because everything, according to Charles Sanders Peirce, who I generally tend to follow in terms of my theory of semiotics that I've tried to develop over the years, is uh, everything is potentially a sign. Mm -hmm. And as a possible sign, it can become a sign insofar as that sign has become a sign for somebody or something mm -hmm. that is interpreted as such and such, meaning, of course, the meaning of the interpretation of the sign. And so virtually it includes, you might say, the entire universe, it's possible mm -hmm. signs and actual signs being becoming processed as signs. Mm -hmm. And the signs, of course, are never static as well. Signs are always becoming other signs. And a given sign is always becoming something other than what it was becoming because it is processed, and so nothing is static, nothing stands still. And then I guess part of that um, not standing still is the person who's doing the interpreting. Of, of the yes. Sign, as well. Yeah. According to Peirce, the interpreter also is a sign. Mm. The sign influences the interpreter insofar as uh, the interpreter is in the process of becoming someone other than that interpreter was becoming mm -hmm. and consequently the sign influenced the interpreter and the interpreter influenced the sign because the sign on be, being interpreted once again mm -hmm. or for the first time as we might put it uh, this sign of course is undergoing a change so the sign itself is becoming another sign as the interpreter a sign also is becoming yet another sign so we, we have a bit of a, an infinite rehearsal process. That is the way that Peirce puts it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It uh, is uh, potentially an infinite regress. Mm -hmm. And uh, he believes that this, uh, since it does involve process, mm -hmm. the interpretation of the sign is ongoing. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, it never reaches absolute finality because, as Peirce puts it, a sign, the interpretation of a sign is never so complete that it can't, cannot be extended just a little bit further. So, of course, we're trying to reach utopia, a semiotic utopia, but we don't stand any sort of a chance of getting there. So what we, what we end up with instead of the meaning is a, is a provisional meaning or a provisional set of meanings. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. All, all meanings, all interpretation is provisional. Uh, many of us, of course, wouldn't like to admit that because what we believe in, we feel we believe in something and that something is relatively static, mm -hmm. is unchanging, so our belief likewise is unchanging as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we are indeed signs ourselves in the process of becoming other, mm -hmm. then our belief is never at standstill either. We would like to think it is, but yet that belief changes with time. Well, that, that leads me to, to my next question, and, and this is to do with your um, look at, at questions of uh, social justice, if, if the question of, of belief is, is a, as much in flux um, as mm -hmm. is the question of what, what signs mean, um, is it difficult to find a, a 
place from which you can critique relations of, of power, of, of, of injustice, of, of social justice. Mm -hmm. Realizing, of course, that everything is undergoing change, uh, yes, change can be critiqued. Mm -hmm. Because uh, even uh, if there are social injustices, and even though these social injustices are themselves undergoing a change for the better or for the worse, mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, the critique can, of course, uh, direct itself toward these social injustices. Mm -hmm. And with the realization that the critique also is undergoing a change. Okay. Because uh, just as so the progress or, or degeneration of the social injustices are undergoing, ch undergoing changes, mm -hmm. we have to always reappraise our own critique. Because this critique, whereas we might have launched it one year ago, mm -hmm. uh, the situation has become quite different in a year's time, usually. Mm -hmm. And consequently, of course, we have to reappraise our critique, perhaps revise it, uh, put, in, put on an appendage here, and maybe delete something there, and so on. Mm -hmm. And consequently, of course, well, we, we must be, we must be, of course, willing to uh, change our own ideas as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe our own concept of social injustice undergoes change as well. And all you have to do is simply consider the history of the United States over the last century and a half. Mm -hmm. Or the, the last century, I should say. And of course, the ideas of social injustice have gone, undergone radical changes. Mm -hmm. And who is to say that our concept of social justice today is, is going to, of course, stand for all time? Mm -hmm. Another century down the road. And obviously, it will have undergone many changes as well. And this, this is the process of semiotics, the process of science becoming other science. Um, is, is there a, a particular um, area of inquiry that, that drew you to question the social justice? Or is there a particular incident that you first set yourself, this is what I need to, to study? Yeah, I, I might uh, try to respond to this question by responding to one of your early questions, mm -hmm. what, what drew me into semiotics. Yeah. Um, I began in the sciences, chemistry and physics. I became very interested in Latin America as an area. I went into that area uh, academically and ended up with a PhD finally in Latin American studies. And it was while I was writing my dissertation that I actually discovered uh, semiotics, and especially the semiotics of Charles Peirce. And I really didn't um, enter into his very rich, very complicated theory until after I'd finished my dissertation, actually, and begun my professional career. Mm -hmm. And so that began, uh, my interest in PERS began at the same time that I became a university professor there at Purdue University. Mm -hmm. And um, since I was also in Latin American studies, uh, extended trips to Latin America during research, simply uh, for purpose of travel. My wife is from Mexico. I spent much time in Mexico. And, um, of course, I became more aware than ever of the injustices in Latin America, mm -hmm. and especially due to the fact that we do spend some time in Brazil now every year, and uh, we do volunteer work with poor people mm -hmm. for uh, professional agencies, uh, uh, government organizations, non-government organizations as well, and on our own, because mm -hmm. we know people in poverty-stricken areas as well. And we visit them often and try to do whatever we can. We take things for them, help them out, uh, help them work on their homes, which are becoming, in many cases, very dilapidated, mm -hmm. things like that. It's made me painfully aware of the distinctions, terrible distinctions, between those who have and those who have not, mm -hmm. and social injustices that bring those conditions out. And consequently, I really don't think it is a place of a study of semiotics at all to avoid this. Um, there are people who work with semiotics in terms of uh, what they would tend to call pure theory. Mm. Uh, I think that pure theory, of course, is relatively nonsensical unless, of course, you find some way to apply that to contemporary cultures and societies. I think, I think the two should go hand in hand. If theory is divorced from everyday living, then the theory, of course, uh, has been inapplicable and non-applicable, of course, has no function, as far as I'm concerned, in our society. And um, everyday living, of course, calls for some sort of explanation beyond the explanations that have been given up to this point. Mm 
Mm. And that's quite obvious, I believe, because social injustices continue. In many cases, they're becoming worse. Mm. In some cases, fortunately, they're becoming better. And, and that's due to a lot of different kinds of work. I mean, there isn't only one, yes. one way to yes. approach the, the, the yes, question. Definitely. So definitely. that the writing that you're doing, um, which at times may seem removed, may end up actually helping the situation. Yes, in a, in a sense I sort of live in, in two different worlds because mm -hmm. um, you know I write on semiotic theory and uh, recently I've tried to present this in a form of application of semiotics mm -hmm. more than in the past. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in a way I write about semiotic theory plus I do some publications uh, in Latin American culture, mm. in many cases these are these tend to be non-semiotic, mm. and of course in real life, everyday living in Latin America, of course I'm always attuned toward the social injustices, and uh, it uh, plagues me at times. Yeah. And I realize that I should. I'm very limited in terms of what I can do, but on a personal basis with people that I know, I feel I can make a little bit of difference. But like I said, I sort of live in two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see, of course, um, university programs in general, mm -hmm. uh, having more outreach programs, and that's something that's becoming more, more prevalent all the time. And um, theory in the universities, in the social sciences and the humanities especially, mm -hmm. of course, becoming more attuned toward the semiotic processes, that is, everyday processes that exist out there in our world. Um, I want to um, read uh, back to you a, a quotation from a work you published, I think in the 80s, uh, Capriora and Cantongla. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, conform the full title uh, continues, Conformity and Resistance in, in Brazil. And uh, you say of uh, Capriora that it, quote, plays havoc with our need for a clear-cut world, uh, conveniently classified and labeled. Say what Capiora is, and you say what it is not. Say it is slam bang in your face, uh, rumbling, much as in martial arts, and it is not. It is good natured play. Say it is dancing, and you're wrong. It is struggle, a ludic form of struggle. <laughs> say it's frivolous play, fine tuned acrobatics, brute strength. Capiora is never either one thing or the other, it's always both and neither. Now, it, it seems to me that this interpretive form that, that you've used. Uh, uh, in, in that quotation, it, it kind of comes up repeatedly in semiotic analysis, maybe even all post-structural analysis. And I guess my question is, you know, what do we gain by yet another demonstration that human meanings are multiple, that there's a multiplicity of, of, of meanings? Because we seem to get the same outcome whenever mm -hmm. we, we apply this theoretical mm -hmm. framework. Yeah. Um, as, as you gather by that mm -hmm. quote there, uh, I'm in love with paradoxes, inconsistencies, ambiguities and such, because I believe that uh, basically they are one of the premier aspects of our contemporary cultures mm -hmm. and human cultures all the way back to the beginning. Um, in the first place, and in the second place, the use of those two terms, conformity and resistance. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, used those two terms prevalently in that particular book, and since, uh, since that book was published, I've used the two terms constantly. Mm -hmm. And the way it came out in that book is in the uh, creation of Capoeira, Brazilian mm -hmm. Capoeira. Uh, it was created by the slaves during the slavery period in Brazil. And the slaves, of course, for survival purposes, knew they had to conform. Mm -hmm. If not, there would be punishment, there might even be death. Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, conformity was advisable. Mm -hmm. Yet, they simply weren't satisfied with simply conforming to, of course, uh, this terrible, terrible, terrible state. This so they were presenting a sign of conforming? On the surface, mm -hmm. on the surface of conforming. Mm -hmm. Capoeira now looks like it's dance, looks like it's singing, looks like it's instrument, instrument playing. It looks like a recreation. They look and act like they're having a lot of fun, gay mm -hmm. time. That's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. According to one of the traditional interpretations, uh, probably the most pre prevalent of the interpretation of capoeira, mm -hmm. because it looks like martial arts. Actually, of course, they're presenting this surface facade of conformity. Mm -hmm. They're simply 
having a lot of fun while he could because tomorrow would be a rough day in the fields. Uh, however, of course, in the event that they were able to escape and defend themselves, in the event that they were being punished severely and they wanted to strike back, they could use, of course, capoeira as practice in order to keep in good shape, in order to um, make your moves more or less in line with defense of your own, your own bodily property. Yeah. And so, of course, it was conformity, yet it was resistance, potentially resistance in the future. It was resistance, yet you do have conformity. And of course, there's, um, there's a little bit of ambiguity and even paradox in this form of behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, it seemed to work out quite effectively for the African slaves. Mm -hmm. It's become very popular in Brazil today, and you have copyrighted schools throughout the entire world. But basically what's behind that is conformity and resistance. Mm -hmm. And you can see that if you observe everyday living in the schools, at work, at play, in the home, uh, on the streets or whatever. You can see, of course, these different aspects of the same form of behavior, conflicting, even inconsistent aspects of the same form of behavior in societies throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very prevalent aspect of human beings in general. So what you end up demonstrating uh, with your analysis is that what we may take to be the case mm -hmm. generally isn't. Yes. And neither is it the fact that, oh, it's really the opposite of what you think it is. It's, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. It's yes. more complicated than that. Yes, you have, uh, you have the plus side and the minus side, the mm -hmm. good and the bad, mm -hmm. you know, the, true, the, the, true, the true and the false, yeah. and so on. Uh, yet, since signs are always changing, mm -hmm. since conditions are always changing, environments are changing, contexts are always changing, we are always changing, mm -hmm. of course, uh, what is the plus side might become a little bit less than the plus side mm -hmm. because it's infiltrated by the minus side or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And consequently, of course, you always have mediation of the two um, opposite poles of an inconsistency or an opposition. And consequently, with this mediation, both poles are always becoming something other than what they were becoming. Mm -hmm. And consequently, you have a mediation of the two poles, like, uh, you know, the the mythical snake that begins eating itself, the, extreme, mm -hmm. the extremities meet. Mm -hmm. And what is in opposition is always becoming, to a greater or a lesser extent, of course, one is one. Now, I don't know whether to characterize what you're saying as you becoming mystical or you becoming more philosophical. Or is there a difference? You read that in the Tao, you read it in the Semiotics of Charles Sanders Purge, you read it in many, many philosophers in the Western tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, off and on, of course, they tend to wax just a little bit mystical, mysterious, uh, enigmatic, yeah. or for whatever reason. Um, yes, yes. I've, I've uh, taken many of these ideas, basically, from um, Eastern thought as well. Yeah. Peirce himself was, to a certain extent, even though you don't find much indication of this in his writings, mm -hmm. to a certain extent, I really believe that he was influenced by uh, Eastern thought as well. Um, your, one of your more recent interests uh, is, is in how cultures com come together. Uh, I think your, your talk uh, later today is, well, at least the title is, is you know, to do with cultural collisions or, or cultures mm -hmm. uh, coming mm -hmm. into place. Are, are you thinking uh, in terms of cultural hybridity, contact zones, imperialism and colonization, are you using one of, one of those ready-made ways of thinking about culture, or are you branching out in some way? Yes, I've never been totally satisfied with any of those terms, hybridity, transculturation, especially uh, the term syncretism and such mm. as that. I've never felt really comfortable with these terms. I've always been looking for some alternative. I haven't come up with anything that I'm totally satisfied with yet, mm. but uh, I do have a trio of terms. Uh, as a good person. <laughs> Con contradictory, complementary, coalescence. Huh. Because contradiction is always with us. You start out with the plus side and the minus side, like I already mentioned. Complementarity, which you find in much uh, Eastern thought. And also, I've always continued my studies of science and philosophy of science. And complementarity is one of the basic principles of 
quantum theory, mm. and uh, according to um, Niels Bohr's interpretation of complementarity, and he was influenced by Eastern thought as well, uh, this is a way of rendering quantum theory something that's almost totally indescribable in ordinary languages, mm. English, German, uh, French, or what have you. Yet with the complementarity principle, you can bring them together, and to use a term that I used earlier, uh, mediation, you mm. can mediate these terms and bring them together in such a way that they become relatively um, describable, relatively mm. comprehensible. And of course they're always in coalescence, and that uh, uh, person's idea of signs becoming different signs, always in the process of becoming other, has to do with, of course, signs coalescing. Mm. So we begin with contradiction, the plus sign, the minus sign, mm. and of course eventually there is a, a emergence, a, a fusion, a welding together of these signs. And if we want to expand this out and make it very general, mm. a clash of cultures mm. is the plus side and the minus side. Mm. It's us against them. Mm. You know, we're good, they're evil, mm -hmm. whatever. Right. However you want to put it, there's a plus side and a minus side. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, if these cultures become construed as complementary rather than simply contradictory. Mm -hmm. We're partly down that path, mm -hmm. and of course if we can bring about a confluence of cultures in such a way that the inhabitants of one culture can at least talk to people in another culture, mm -hmm. dialogue with people in another culture, and vice versa, then of course we're along the path toward resolving many of the problems, I think. But it has to be a very long and very painful process. It's nothing that's easy. It's mm -hmm. complex. And, and so perhaps uh, the way you approach uh, contact with, with another culture or sharing living space within the culture conditions wh whether you're moving towards complementariness or whether you're mm -hmm. moving towards clash or whether you're moving towards coalescence. Because at some point, the, these these signs aren't doing the merging on their own. It, it's it's, it's uh, human agency. Human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, human agent. Human agent who themselves are signs, who themselves are in the process, like all signs, of becoming other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so consequently, of course, um, there's never any end to the game. Mm -hmm. It's ongoing. Conflicts there will always be. No matter how congenial two people will be, there are always conflicts of a greater or lesser degree. And of course, inventive. <laughs> yes, yes. And so when a conflict arises, uh, you have to start the game again. Mm -hmm and move it toward uh, mediation and complementarity and move it toward a course of a mutual understanding and comprehension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's ongoing. Yeah. Um, I, I'd, I'd love for this to be an ongoing interview, but <laughs> we're gonna have to cut it short fairly soon. I, I wanna end with one, with one last uh, general question. Um, I was wondering how you see the, the, the study of semiotics now as compared to when you first got interested or maybe in the, in the 70s, and where do you see it, 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 it heading? Are you, are you excited by the possibilities that, that you see in, in your work taking you elsewhere, or what maybe others are, are doing with semiotics and questions of social justice? Uh -huh. Semiotics, when, when I um, uh, moved into the area of semiotics uh, in the 70s, mm -hmm. basically, most, most fundamentally in the latter 70s, uh, it was becoming quite big. A few universities were trying to develop, in the United States, were trying to develop programs of semiotics. Brown University even developed a PhD in semiotics and such. And it seemed to be the wave of the future, like many of your so-called isms, they yeah. come and go. Yeah. Fifteen years or so, as Levi Strauss once said. Yeah. And uh, semiotics, of course, tended to wane uh, in the 80s and into the 90s and yeah. up, to the, up to today. There are uh, groups in Japan, in China, in uh, uh, Russia, uh, in, in throughout all of Europe, in Latin America, the United States, Australia, Canada, and basically all over the world, who uh, are still very intensely doing semiotics. But uh, the word itself, and of course the practice of semiotics, has become more generalized. I see more and more of the word used in various disciplines, even in biology today, because there is a very important school of biosemiotics mm. in uh, Copenhagen. And consequently, it's becoming more 
general in in all areas of research, whereas semiotics per se, of course, is, is being concentrated in small groups or who still maintain intense interest in semiotics. But I think that's the way it's going to continue for some time. Uh, in the beginning, many people were seeing semiotics as just another discipline that will uh, have a department in the university campuses, and, uh, and of course it will be treated like the sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. And of course that never came, never came about. And I think it's better that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. We have uh, too much of an infiltration, I think, of disciplines mm -hmm. in the recent past. We don't need yet another one. Which is even tougher to be interdisciplinary. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Very well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate this. I'm very thankful. I, I thank you for the interview.